Welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here for today's tech talk featuring NXP and Arturis, who will be talking about a smart occupancy sensor they built using ARM Ethos 65. My name is Mary Benyon, and I'll be your host today. If you're enjoying this presentation and you'd like to give us a shout out on Twitter, you can tweet us at ARM Software Dev with the hashtag of AIVTT. You can also find today's recording on our YouTube channel, as well as previous tech talks you may have missed out on. I'll paste the URL in the chat box so you can go and check that out. And finally, if you'd like to sign up for some upcoming tech talks, you can go to arm.com slash tech talks. Upcoming tech talks we have, we're very excited about is uh, on November 22nd, we have DaVinci, which is a uh, tool for hands-on continuous learning at the edge. And then on December 6th, we have a little special treat is uh, we've got some ARM engineers who will be coming and giving a workshop to you all. So stay tuned for further details on that. All right, so let's get to it. I'm excited to introduce Ali Osman Ors from NXP and David Steele from Arturis. But before we get into that, I wanna mention that if you have any questions, please enter them in the Q&A box below and we will get to them at the end. We'll make sure to leave plenty of time for your questions. Um, enough from me, so let's get started. Hi, David, I'm gonna hand over control to you and um, have at it. Ah. Thanks, Barry. I really appreciate that, and thanks for uh, having us uh, here today. Uh, hi, folks, and you know, welcome to the webinar. You know, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is David Steele. I'm the uh, director of innovation at Arcturus. Uh, at Arcturus, I'm responsible for ML uh, and AI, including uh, Brink, which is our commercial uh, edge AI and vision analytics product line. Uh, Ali. Uh, thanks, David. Thanks a lot, Mary, for uh, uh, for leading us in uh, to this and giving us the platform. Um, I'm Ali Ors, uh, folks. I lead the, the global AI ML strategy and technologies at NXV uh, for all of our uh, edge processing needs. And um, very excited to be talking about the IDOTMX uh, 9 um, series and the IDOTMX 9.3 family specifically with its ML enablement and applications that it enables um, for the market. So I'll hand it to David to take us in and um, looking forward to a great uh, tech talk. Cool, thanks, Ali. Uh, so today's topic is energy efficient ML vision application development with e Ethos uh, U65 micro NPU. And uh, the way that we're gonna handle today's topic is we're going to cover it by uh, looking at it through the lens of an emerging use case. Uh, hopefully this, this will kind of keep it a little bit more interesting and give us a good application to discuss along the way. And so the use case, as Mary mentioned, that we're gonna look at is smart occupancy sensing, which is an ideal application for the emerging generation of low power ML accelerated processors. And so to cover this off, uh, Ali will introduce uh, NXP's new IDNMX uh, uh, 93 processor with Ethos U65 micro NPU. Uh, he'll cover off enablement using NXP's EIQ ML environment. Then I'll talk about a novel application of ML DevOps to help build flexible and scalable vision systems using microservices and containerization. Then we'll do a bit of a deep dive into the analytics required to build a smart occupancy sensor, and we will conclude with a, a quick demo. Um, Ali, anything I missed on that front or? No, nope, we're all, all right. good, let's get going. All right, yeah, we've got a lot to cover today. Um, why don't we uh, just jump jump right in and understand a little bit more about uh, why occupancy sensing is uh, such a prescient topic today. So as you likely know, for, uh, the work from home um, has impacted commercial real estate uh, tremendously. You know, I recently read a headline from uh, CBRE, the big real estate magnet, that uh, declared the five-day in-office work week was officially dead. And uh, while this might be a bit of hyperbole, the facts are pretty compelling. Uh, to start on a daily basis, 37% of the desks in any given office are vacant. Uh, office life has also evolved uh, from assigned desks and offices to hoteling and hot desking. People are no longer in fixed locations in the office. Uh, they move around. Meeting rooms are also more heavily used as teams gather at the office really for the purpose of having that interaction and in-person collaboration. And this means a couple of things. Number one, uh, companies are taking a very hard look at how much uh, real estate space they really actually need. And secondly, welcoming people back to the office means that we have to start thinking about how to remove the barriers that make office life painful. 
And uh, even in pre-pandemic times, it was estimated that up to 60 minutes of uh, a week was wasted trying to find a desk, trying to find a meeting room or a person. And uh, when you extrapolate that out, that translates to a staggering $27 billion in lost time annually in the US alone. And that's a heck of a lot of interns. Um, finally, getting people back to the office uh, also involves human factors and uh, supporting progressive back to, back to the office strategies. And that might mean doing things like um, enhanced cleaning routines or you know, making people more aware of the cleaning routines that are already in place. Maybe it's redesigning office floor plans uh, to help minimize unnecessary bottlenecks or monitoring the capacity of spaces uh, to ensure that uh, they're not overutilized or underutilized. So the one thing is certain, uh, physical workspace is in the midst of disruption, and there is one thing that companies need uh, to navigate through this, and that one thing is data. And uh, so let's talk about uh, how smart occupancy sensors can fill that role. So let's talk about uh, occupancy sensing in general and maybe think about traditional occupancy sensors. What, what is a traditional occupancy sensor? Uh, well, up, to, up till now, it's been a fairly simple sensor that monitors physical space. It's typically mounted on a ceiling or wall. You know, commonly these are used to detect intrusion or control HVAC or lighting in a building. Typically they use passive infrared or ultrasonic sensors. And these are great technologies because they're extremely cheap, but they have a lot of limitations. Uh, number one, uh, they don't detect stationary people very well. They're error prone. They provide very limited data. And there, there are other sensor alternatives available, range finders, but these technologies tend to have limited field of views and don't work well in a room environment. And there's also radar-based sensors that are emerging, but currently these are a bit cost prohibitive and they're pretty difficult to use. So given existing technologies, how would we make an occupancy sensor smarter? Well, we'd probably start coming up with our wish list of what we'd want it to do. And the things that we wanted to do would be to handle a large area using a wide field of view. We'd want it to be able to detect and classify people so that we can count them uh, to determine capacity and unique visits. We'd want to provide localization of where individual people are to do things like determine which desks are occupied and which desks are vacant. We'd want to provide tracking capability to see how people use the space to identify congestion, bottlenecks, or unused areas. And ideally, we'd want to ensure privacy, and we do that by processing everything at the edge. And it's these requirements that make vision a good option because um, vision uses uh, low-cost uh, commodity camera components. The hardware architecture is mature and well understood. ML models and data sets exist. And edge processors with the right level of ML acceleration are available. Uh, today. And uh, so with that, why don't I turn things over to Ali Ors from NXP, who's going to talk about uh, edge processors for ML and vision applications. Thanks, David. Let's go. There we go. So I'm going to be talking about the IDOMX 9.3 SOC uh, with the Ethos U65 Micro NPU uh, integrated today. Um, of course, uh, I'll start at the beginning. Uh, so as NXP, we have a fairly long history of applications processors uh, that we put out into the market, um, starting with uh, the IDOMX uh, lineup itself, um, with a long pedigree with the IDOMX uh, 6, uh, IDOMX 8, um, series uh, within that with the Idomix 8M family of various products. And the latest uh, in that uh, long lineup is our Idomix 9 series of applications processors. So this is a newer generation uh, that we, again, builds on top of a very scalable compute uh, environment, very rich uh, connectivity, added uh, multi-sensory experiences in terms of media support, graphic support, uh, audio, uh, vision uh, processing, voice processing, touch sensing type of um, enablements. Um, and um, most of this family going forward is uh, planned to have integrated uh, ML accelerators. Uh, the first one in this family is uh, that we've announced and are currently sampling is the Adatomix 9.3 uh, series. And uh, this device um, Upgrades are um, a, a Cortex A core to the main CPU to a A55, and uh, this is a um, this generation of CPU from ARM has uh, various improvements over the existing A53 that was widely used in our IDATM X8 um, series of devices. It is the most efficient 64-bit uh, mid-range Cortex A core currently from ARM. 
Uh, we're showing here some of the performance upgrades that you can uh, expect to see between an A53 and an A55. And the IDATA MX93 uh, family has uh, up to two uh, A55 cores in them. Um, there are also variants with one A55 core, um, but uh, the, the larger device, the flagship 93, uh, is a double um, dual core um, A55 uh, main CPU. Of course, these are um, security is, is a very large part of uh, what we uh, offer. It's one of the main pillars at NXP. And the Idonomics 9 um, series is definitely also uh, benefiting from um, NXP's long uh, history in this domain of offering highly secure um, devices, offering a lot of functionality and enablement around uh, security aspect. So we're going beyond crypto, adding a lot of um, runtime on die security elements uh, like silicon root of trust, trust provisioning, uh, key management. Um, all of this is part of the hardware, and plus there's a software uh, component that sits on top with uh, what we enable. Um, and if, uh, I mean, uh, the secure enclave alone is another uh, long discussion. So if you're interested, we definitely um, have more information at nxp.com and additional content there, as this is a, a horizontal technology that is across a lot of our families and keeps getting better. Now on the IOMX 93 specifically itself, it's being it's been built as a very flexible um, architecture in terms of power um, dissipation as well. So we've looked at a very uh, fine grained hierar hierarchical um, power partitioning model with our architecture. So we have multiple domains that can be controlled independently to power on and off as needed. Uh, there's the main application domain. This is where the, the, the main CPU, the Cortex-A core uh, resides. And this is your high performance domain where you're running your main application. Uh, of course, you have, um, then you have your real-time domain with a Cortex-M33. Uh, this is where you have, um, you're able to control your peripherals. It can be running in the background potentially to uh, detect wake words, detect actually a wake event uh, in the example that we're going to be demonstrating today in presence detection. Uh, you can detect and wake up on a Cortex M um, and then uh, bring in the flex domain, which is where you have your added um, multimedia and uh, accelerators such as the NPU itself, the micro NPU, the Ethos U65 in the flex domain. And you can cycle through um, various power uh, modes uh, as your application demands it. And um, the communication between these domains is handled through messaging units to keep everything secure and um, enable the previous topic around security as well. Um, expanding on uh, what we have done in the past with um, our IDOTM X8 series of uh, devices, specifically the 8M Plus, which was uh, the first device in uh, our apps processor portfolio with a dedicated uh, machine learning core. Uh, that is becoming uh, more and more um, part of the, you know, Part of our plans to have this available as a dedicated accelerator in most of the IDATM X9 family going forward. Um, and on the IDATM X93, we have the Ethos U65 micro NPU. So this is a very efficient MCU class um, accelerator dedicated for uh, ML workloads. It sits, um, it leverages the Cortex M core uh, for control. Uh, and at NXP, I'll be getting into it. We've also enabled it to. Uh, what's called fallback on the Cortex-A and leverage some of the um, added performance of the Cortex-A core, as well as the uh, benefits of the Linux uh, capable uh, core itself beyond uh, the base enablement that was available. Uh, and all of this, of course, is enabled through our uh, NXP uh, EIQ machine learning development environment, which we'll also uh, touch a bit on. This is our overall um, uh, block diagram. A uh, couple of things uh, to call out. As I mentioned, it's a, it's a dual Cortex-A55 uh, main CPU um, in the applications domain. We have the uh, low power real-time domain with the Cortex-M33 uh, microcontroller. And then in the flex domain uh, of relevance to our talk today, uh, we have the, uh, the main graphics, um, the IDOTM X93, is not a, a graphics monster. It's, it has a 2D GPU, so it's more about um, drawing basic, um, uh, you know, driving basic displays. Um, but it's uh, mainly about uh, camera input. Again, 
um, not a very large count of camera, not a very large um, resolution of cameras, but capable of handling um, 1080p at 60 frames per second input through the, the maybe CSI uh, dual lane input. Um, so it's, it's geared and sized according to uh, being a very efficient IoT apps processor. Um, and it is, um, I say IoT, but it's also uh, rated for automotive and industrial uses as well. Um, the, the micro MP itself uh, is uh, an ARM Ethos U65. Um, this is the, uh, the basic uh, building blocks around the, the micro NPU. Um, of note is, of course, the, the main processing is done in the Mac units. So this is the fundamental uh, compute element to uh, most neural networks, CNNs or multi-layer perceptron type of uh, neural networks. Um, and having um, a good compute engine is only um, takes you so far, you also need to be able to feed that, uh, that engine itself with the, the data. So the Ethos U65 has um, a dual AXI5 um, AMBA buses coming in, uh, being controlled by the DMA controller, and a central control that handles the, the general instructions that the NPU uh, needs to uh, execute on. And all of this is um, you know, also leveraging a shared memory that is dedicated to the MPU of about 380 kilobytes uh, for it um, to, to maintain a very efficient execution uh, at about a half top range at one gigahertz. Now, um, all of that efficiency, um, I mean, CPUs are typically uh, the most flexible um, uh, compute engines that you have uh, on a device, uh, even with a reduced instruction set. Uh, it's still capable of handling a lot of complexity in the instruction set in the ICA itself. Um, and um, the, the NPU is, uh, is a simpler engine uh, in terms of the execution, uh, but these, this delta between the CPU versus the NPU is kind of highlighted in this chart of what we're able to show um, on a normalized um, runtime, what you're able to run on an A55 compared to um, the, the performance that you get on the Ethos U65 NPU, specifically you're getting a large uh, multiplier in terms of throughput efficiency in inferences per second or frames per second, since these are mostly um, vision-based machine learning models. Um, and this is why uh, we've gone down the path of um, you know, putting an NPU in our apps processors, because a lot of the workloads in today's uh, verticals in the market require uh, machine learning to be part of the overall application. Um, and the best way to uh, support that is to have an NPU that gives you this boost of sometimes 20, 30, 40 X uh, overall performance in your ML uh, workload throughput. Now, all of that, of course, needs to be enabled. And um, this takes us back to um, the overall enablement that NXP provides for um, our full portfolio, uh, a very large uh, um, you know, set of our portfolio that goes from traditional MCUs uh, like the MCX-N uh, uh, family or the LPC family of traditional MCUs, our uh, crossover Ionics RT MCUs with uh, M cores that can run up to a gigahertz, and at the higher end, our apps processors, which the Idatomix 8 uh, or the Idatomix 9 series are part of, Idatomix 9.3 specifically as a family is part of the apps processor range as well. And we enable all of this with our EIQ uh, machine learning environment, uh, with our toolkit that you can leverage for um, data labeling, curation, model conversion, training, optimization, quantization, the, the usual supervised ML uh, workload development, um, all the way down to validating profiling for a given hardware target of a, an XP device and uh, run that um, on the NXP device. And we try to enable um, a very wide uh, experience level of users. So embedded developers that are just getting into the ML uh, space, they're porting over some, uh, some of their code maybe to leverage machine learning, as well as ML experts that might have their own tools, their own um, scripts, et cetera, and want to come in and leverage uh, some of the efficiencies that are um, need to be um, supported by NXP to really uh, run and deploy onto the hardware. And we build this all with um, into three main application pillars in uh, vision predominantly, uh, as that's the largest part of the market, but also audio voice and non-voice uh, time series like anomaly detection um, type of workloads. 
how this applies to the Ethos U65 um, is um, there's a, a set of offline tools that are being integrated into EIQ uh, that are uh, originally from ARM, uh, like the Vela tool itself. So it's a model loader and optimizer. Uh, this is then uh, ported through the optimized uh, model generation model runner into uh, something that can run on the Cortex A CPU for the application. Um, and the message is over to the Cortex M CPU uh, in the microcontroller, which sits as the con main controller for the micro NPU, the e Ethos U65, and handles the messages and can run TF Lite Micro as the inference engine, uh, leveraging Synthesis NN if needed for the MCU, uh, or leveraging the NPU driver itself to run on the Ethos U65. Um, this is our overall software architecture between uh, leveraging EIQ uh, software in combination with ARM software for the Vela model tool and the Ethos U driver, uh, and deploying onto uh, NXP hardware through um, the NXP BSB, which handles your uh, messaging and potentially um, use of free RTOS type of RTOSs for drive. And uh, we've, we've taken a, a view of um, originally moving uh, beyond the, the fallback. So anytime you have an operator that doesn't actually get recognized or is not able to run on the um, micro NPU, the Ethos U65, uh, the traditional uh, method of handling that is the fallback onto the Cortex-M to handle that operator. Um, as the IVATM X9 III is um, a heterogeneous compute environment that also had a Cortex-A in it, uh, we chose to expand that capability to allow for the fallback to go up to the Cortex-A potentially to um, leverage the higher performance of the Cortex-A, the higher capabilities that uh, Linux running uh, CPU uh, would provide. So uh, in collaboration with ARM, NXP has extended uh, that uh, capability to also uh, fall back all the way to the Cortex-A and leverage the, uh, the Linux environment and the higher performance of the Cortex-A core. And, um, so this is our overall uh, stack uh, right now, where we're able to um, run um, full uh, application, camera-based application, for example, through the uh, video processing and connectivity uh, between ourselves, ARM for the hardware IP blocks, and uh, Arcturus on uh, the higher levels that sit above the OS in terms of the algorithm, the application itself, um, and uh, the management of that. So here, um, I'll hand over to David um, to take us through. Thanks, Ali. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, you, you summarized things well, actually. This stack up uh, diagram helps really, I think, to illustrate how um, NXP's EIQ ML environment helps with kind of the, the offline data set model creation and, uh, and, the, and the runtime and how that fits into a, an overall solution. At uh, Arcturus, we specialize in developing the overall system application, and this generally starts uh, by optimizing the model in runtime. Then we need to do some accuracy and performance analysis. There's usually some model training and fine tuning and further optimizations to ensure that it's running efficiently on the edge hardware that might be quantization or whatever it may be. And for us, uh, EIQ um, is an important part of this work, and IDOT Max 93 is critical for those tasks. Now, in our stack, we try to provide as much uh, flexibility as we can by supporting multiple runtime and model options, including support for TensorFlow Lite, uh, RMNN, and PyTorch. And this is important because uh, with our smart occupancy sensor, we don't necessarily require hard real-time video processing. We're not trying to do uh, 15 frames per second or greater. And this gives us the flexibility to choose a model and runtime combination with the best performance, uh, the best balance of performance and accuracy. Uh, that we need for our application. For example, if we wanted a higher frame rate, we can use a lightweight model such as MobileNet. Uh, if we wanted a higher accuracy, we can use a model like YOLO. And once we've uh, selected and optimized the detection model, we can create the analytic application. Arcturus has a number of off-the-shelf uh, analytics applications um, that range from uh, detecting people, or vehicles, packages. Uh, we can do behavior detection and demographic detection. And what's important to uh, smart occupancy sensors is, is in fact tracking. And this is something you may not immediately think about, but we'll get to this uh, a, a little bit more in this presentation. Uh, tracking is something that Arcturus has some, uh, some real deep expertise in. Our object uh, tracking analytic uh, recently placed in the top 10 globally at the uh, multiple object uh, tracking benchmark challenge. 
very proud of this result, if, uh, especially considering our solution is optimized for edge processing and the uh, benchmark challenge is open to cloud and big GPU submissions as well. So I'll cover off tracking a little bit more later in the presentation, but uh, suffice it to say, uh, to round out a product, uh, it's necessary to also have the connectivity management telemetry and data storage components, much like uh, Ali said. And from that perspective, that creates kind of the essential capabilities that we need uh, to build a smart occupancy sensor. Uh, we can also look at this a little bit more from the hardware standpoint. And what we're trying to emphasize with this simplified block diagram is that the requirements for a vision-based sensor are straightforward and pretty well understood. The components are in and interfaces are mature and low risk. Essentially, this design is a simplified IP camera. So there's a vision system, subsystem connected using MIPI CSI. We've got options for wired and wireless networking. And then we have enough system memory suitable to run Linux and handle our edge AI processing. And costs for this design can be kept pretty low because um, commodity MIPI camera components are uh, broadly available. Uh, video storage requirements for this application are minimal because we're using inference metadata, uh, not video. We're not trying to store days or weeks worth of video. There's no streaming video requirement. We don't need to encode it using a licensed uh, codec like H.264. And we don't need to render any complex graphics, so we don't need a powerful GPU. And this means that the iDynamx 9.3 peripheral set aligns well with this type of, uh, this type of sensor application. Uh, okay, we've couple, covered it, enablement and a high level look at software and hardware. Let me just grab a quick drink of water here. Uh, it's time to uh, go down the rabbit hole and uh, discuss uh, vision pipeline architecture and uh, specifically why it's important to consider flexibility and scalability early on in the design cycle. Now, this is a uh, very simplified vision pipeline. It starts with uh, video ingest processing on the left and results in output on the right. Uh, inference and analytics nodes are used to capture the insights that uh, are necessary for the core application. Uh, a traditional vision pipeline like this would be developed in a very monolithic way with uh, each pipeline node communicating using uh, IPC, message passing, pipes, buffers, shared memory. And this is extremely efficient, uh, but it's also very rigid. Uh, what this means is that changing the pipeline workflow to uh, doing things like adding a second analytic node or offloading a specific task, or even changing the model would result in rewriting a considerable amount of code. Instead, if we think of each node in this pipeline as a microservice, we can transform this pipeline into discrete, discrete components and then use APIs and sockets to interconnect, to interconnect them. And this uh, gives us the benefit of being able to change nodes, add nodes, remove nodes, all without destabilizing the overall pipeline or rewriting a lot of code. Using sockets also decouples each node from the underpinning hardware it's processed on, uh, allowing us to move nodes across interconnected systems. And the key benefit of all of this is that it's really easy to facilitate experimentation and provide scalability. Uh, and I can give you a really simple example for, of this. Uh, for example, this architecture makes it really easy to compare different networks and runtimes back to back just simply by swapping out the inference nodes themselves and keeping the rest of the pipeline. And what this does is it helps to converge on the right balance of performance and accuracy quickly. Uh, it also facilitates moving workloads around, making it possible to offload complex models or tasks to the cloud or another piece of specialized hardware if it's needed. And this flexibility is extremely important because with the ML, uh, experimentation is part of the development process. And having an architecture that easily facilitates experimentation will, in fact, reduce overall development time. So we can take this uh, design uh, one step further, and we can apply containers. Uh, containerization allows us to have a central repo where we can manage all of our nodes from. And we can use tools like Docker Compose to orchestrate the creation of the pipelines at runtime. So in other words, what we're doing with containerization is we're leveraging an existing ecosystem to manage and deploy our pipelines in a highly controlled way without needing to build this capability from scratch. So in summary, uh, while a monolithic pipeline will yield slightly better performance because of its tightly coupled nature, a microservices approach offers far better flexibility and scalability. Microservices will allow us to focus on our core application by reducing integration tasks, reducing the amount of code that needs to be written and maintained. 
Uh, by using uh, sockets and defined APIs across the nodes, we can abstract the hardware, which gives us uh, almost limitless scalability. Containerization provides an existing ecosystem to manage and deploy pipelines in a very controlled way. And together, both of these approaches facilitate experimentation, making it possible to evaluate models, uh, run times, balance performance, and help to reduce our overall development time. And this is the uh, um, architecture, this microservices pipeline architecture is what we use here at Arcturus. It's part of our Brink Edge AI Envision Analytics product line. It's also consistent with NIST's uh, architectural recommendations on how to implement vid video analytics. And I can show you a quick um, demo of this architecture applied in a real world. Uh, here's a, this image is a console, which is running on our Atlas, uh, on Arcturus Atlas hardware. Our Atlas hardware is a scalable edge AI inference platform. It can use uh, multiple SOCs. In this case, we're actually running it on a NXP's Item X 8M plus CPU, but the case is identical for the Item X 9.3. Uh, on the top left is the command console. Uh, underneath that is the performance of the video source node, which is has the stream input coming into the device at 25 frames per second. And then just below that is, uh, is top, which is uh, demonstrating the performance of the four. ARM CPU cores. And then on the, uh, on the right side, on the right side, uh, we're running two inference nodes concurrently. The uh, top inference node is performing detection. The inference node underneath that is performing uh, object embeddings, which I'll get into a bit more in a, in a minute. And then the bottom right is the analytics node, which uses the detection and the embeddings. Uh, so the two inference nodes, uh, the output from those to create tracking and re-identification. So when I start this demo, everything is going to be running on the CPU cores. And then what we're going to do is going to reconfigure the pipeline uh, in real time to offload the inference nodes from CPU to MPU. So right now we can see from the analytics output on the bottom right that the system is running at about three frames per second, which is bottlenecked by the inference nodes above. Uh, what we're doing now is just reconfiguring the pipeline. We just uh, changed one JSON config file from CPU to MPU. For the, infrared, for the object detection node, we'll do the same thing for the embeddings node. Let's change that from CPU to MPU. And now we're going to use Docker Compose to orchestrate the new pipeline. And what will happen now is it will restart, and then we'll go through a couple of seconds of what we call an MPU warm-up time. And then what we should see, uh, once, the, once this, the model is uh, warmed up, we should see that the uh, inference node, the object detection inference node, should uh, get a performance uplift, and uh, there it goes. It's running about 24 frames per second. We should see the object embeddings node go through the same process as well. And we do, we can see it's running at 25, 24 frames per second. And then the analytics node is now running at 24.9 frames per second, which is effectively equivalent to the input source, which means they are both running at, uh, basically effectively running at line rate. And the CPU utilization has dropped uh, considerably as well. We can see that with top. So the point here is that uh, with this architecture, it's, it's easy to offload bottlenecks or add new capabilities just by changing a couple of characters in a JSON config file and running Docker Compose. In this case, what we did was we moved uh, nodes from the CPU to the NPU of the same SOC device. However, since we're using you know, sockets, uh, we could have just as easily moved that to another, another discrete component or even to the cloud. Um, the cloud is very interesting because uh, now with uh, ARM V8 uh, based uh, data center processors like AWS Graviton 2, we can create instruction set compatible containers that can run at the edge of the data center, which um, means that this architecture can span seamlessly uh, from IDM X9.3 at the edge all the way up to, uh, to AWS uh, EC2. Okay, so we've covered the uh, architecture of a pipeline system. Now let's talk about how we can apply it to create a smart occupancy sensor. Uh, overall, this is uh, again a summary of uh, of how a smart occupant of a, of a vision pipeline. But in this case, it's our smart occupancy sensor pipeline and what it would look like. Starting with the video ingest, processing it through two inference nodes, then combining the output of the previous nodes and the analytics node where we apply uh, deeper analysis. We, we have some zones and boundaries, tracking and re-identification algorithms. And then the output from the analytics uh, can be sent upstream to the cloud and combined with other sensors, or we can, uh, or we can use it locally to create real-time visualizations or control devices, whatever we need to do at the local level. 
So starting with the uh, video ingest mode, uh, as the name might, uh, might suggest, uh, this, uh, this node uh, gets the video source and it will decode it from whatever input format we're using into a normalized CV mat matrix object, uh, which, is what, which is the format we need for vision processing. In our application, we also apply some uh, low-level privacy mask processing at this level as well. Privacy masks are just a simple way to block out detection areas that we don't want to, uh, don't want to uh, get detection on. For example, let's say if you've got a window inside your space and you don't want to detect things out in the parking lot, you can just put a privacy mask over that. Then uh, in this node, we then uh, serialize the data into uh, a flat buffer format, which is sent to uh, downstream nodes uh, using uh, zero MQ. And uh, from there, the pre-processed video data frame references are fed to the uh, first of two inference nodes. Now, the first task of any inference node is to perform the network dependent pre-processing, which usually involves scaling and resizing to meet the model input parameters. Uh, the, the role of this first inference node in our pipeline is to perform object detection, and the output of that will be bounding box XY coordinates, uh, coordinates and class data. Uh, in this node, we're running a lightweight mobile net V2 SSD model, which has been uh, pre-trained on the COCO data set, specifically filtering uh, detection output for a person class. This is a TF light model uh, using the TF light runtime, which in the ADM plus will be running on the VX delegate on NXP's item X3. Uh, uses, uh, it uses a, a ethos new custom operator and driver built into TF Lite. And this can involve a little bit more model conversion as uh, Ali described in his, uh, in his workflow slide. <clears throat> the second inference node is a specialized node for tracking and re-identification. Uh, it's a, a running object embeddings. This node uh, takes the bounding box reference from the object detection node and processes the pixel data contained inside the bounding box to create a 512 dimension feature vector of the object appearance. And we have to be a little bit careful about uh, the performance of this node uh, because it has to process each object in the field of view. So as the scene gets busier, it can easily become a bottleneck, uh, but there's a few performance tweaks that we can use to optimize. Uh, number one, with the, the model that we actually choose to use, uh, you know, whether we're using something like a ResNet model or a mobile net model, uh, there's also uh, how complex a model is, so the depth of the model, the input size of the model, and the output size of the feature vector. In our application, what we use is a special uh, depth-reduced mobile net V1 model. Um, the Ethos U65 on the Idon MX93 can process about 236 FPS of uh, mobile net V1. We're using a depth-reduced version, which reduces inference time by almost 50% and speeds up processing uh, further, and this gives us a lot of headroom. And we can also be smart about um, when we generate the embeddings and thus not generate them necessarily for every frame. So by using these optimizations, we can effectively eliminate the bottleneck concern in, in our application. And uh, we can run both, uh, both inference nodes concurrently, uh, both the object detection and the embeddings node uh, on the NPU. So then moving on to the uh, analytics node, the core of the analytics node is the tracking logic. Uh, tracking logic. Uh, tracking is required by an occupancy sensing application because we want to uh, determine how many unique people have occupied the space and how they use it. Uh, and we can't determine this just by using object detection alone. Uh, for example, object detection will only give us a count of the objects currently in the field of view. So if one person leaves while another person enters, then the total object count doesn't change even though we've added one unique person. Similarly, if a person leaves the field of view temporarily and returns, we don't want to count them twice. So the second reason why we need to use tracking is that we also want to look at how people interact with the space. Uh, with tracking, we can look at the path people follow as they move around. And this gives us the ability to create some cool, uh, smart analytics. You know, we can do heat maps based on footfall. We can identify, identify areas that are bottlenecks or even areas that are underutilized. Now to implement a good tracking solution requires two parts, uh, motion prediction tracking and re-identification. And motion prediction tracking, what it does is it takes the bounding box coordinates of each object and it feeds them into a common filter. And this common filter is an algorithm that predicts where the object is going to be in the future based on its speed and direction. And then if the object appears within the prediction envelope, then the tracking algorithm reassigns the same identity to the object, uh, thus tracking it. And the cool thing about a common filter approach is it's lightweight and it works well, but 
It's highly dependent on accuracy uh, or an accurate and continuous detections. It's limited to objects with fixed speed and is also unable to reassociate uh, an identity once a track is lost. So, <clears throat> pardon me, we need to overcome these limitations. We need to add a re-identification method. And in this approach, what we do is we use uh, the embeddings that are generated for each object by the MobileNet V1 model. Fundamentally, what embeddings uh, let us do is they give us a, uh, a method to algorithmically measure the visual similarity of objects. So what we can do uh, by associating each motion tracked object with a visual appearance embedding, we can then create a method to re-identify the object even if the motion track is lost. And that gives us our re-identification capability and overcomes the limitations of just motion-based tracking. <clears throat> in this analytic, we also use uh, regions, zones, and boundaries to provide localization within the field of view. For example, if we wanted to determine which desks are currently in use, we can create a zone around the desks. And then when that zone is occupied, then we know that desk is in use. And then the output from the analytics can be, of course, be sent upstream to the cloud or get combined with other sensor data or sent to, uh, to our output node for uh, local, uh, local services. And so finally, the output node, it handles uh, local web services, events, and visualization. We also can handle configuration and settings uh, through the, through the um, local uh, web services. Uh, any local actions that need to be incorporated, such as, um, or any integration, such as lighting, access control, or, or HVAC can all be done here. <clears throat> and the output node is also the place where any long-term data can be saved. Now, with a full-blown IP camera, this would typically be video. Uh, but we, we're not using a full-blown IP camera. For our application, it's much more likely to be a time series database that just contains the historical anonymized metadata for the occupancy statistics and heat maps. <clears throat> uh, so we have a quick, uh, a quick demo of the local visualization and how this works in Ida the Max uh, to detect a desk occupancy in, in an office environment. In the uh, top window, we can see a workspace overlaid with the uh, raw ML detection boxes and tracking information. And then underneath that, we can see the lower window as a visualization of the workspace, but it's using the metadata output to illustrate the real-time uh, desk occupancy. Um, in the bottom window, we can see that uh, we currently only have uh, one desk available. It's a pretty busy, busy office. The, uh, the desk that's available is in the light blue, and we have five occupied desks in, in the dark blue. And uh, when I start this video, a woman is going to enter and claim that unoccupied desk. So what we will do is we will mark it as occupied. And this video is just in a loop, so she's going to uh, disappear. And then after a couple of seconds of debounce, we'll clear the occupancy and she'll, uh, she'll come and claim her desk again. Uh, there's a couple of other things we can do. <clears throat> we can easily uh, change and configure the desks and zones. We just need to uh, open the settings and just uh, select the zone that we want to change. And that will give us access to the key points of the polygons. And we can just drag the polygon around to change the zone and then save it and, and reapply it. So <clears throat> very simple to, to use, easy to make changes. <coughs> Pardon me. So just to uh, <clears throat> wrap things up, uh, we've talked about the role of smart occupancy sensors in the workplace. <clears throat> we've provided an overview of the IDMX 9.3 Edge hardware that can power them, the ML tools and DevOps methods that can be used to make them efficient and scalable. And also we've given you an overview of the overall pipeline architecture for smart occupancy sensing. Uh, so I think uh, that brings us to just uh, a couple of uh, remaining items here. Um, and maybe what I'll do now, as I clear my throat, is uh, maybe just hand this over to, to Ali to, uh, to kick off some, uh, some things for Man XP here. Thanks, David. Um, great demo, um, by the way. And uh, I just wanted to uh, reiterate on some of the additional resources and information that's available on the uh, IDOM X93. So definitely you can reach out to the nxp.com uh, landing pages for both the generally the applications processors that we have uh, in our portfolio. Uh, the 93 currently is sampling and there's information available on it and uh, in general on the 93 family. 
Um, we've also touched on the EIQ ML software development environment. Um, so that has its own uh, set of information, uh, a QR code um, that can take you to, to the same nxp.com slash EIQ um, spot. And we do have a set of uh, training videos and training content, app notes, et cetera, all around uh, our machine learning um, capabilities, both in terms of software enablement, uh, as well as um, hardware and devices that support uh, ML in general. And all of that is available through uh, nxp.com slash ML training. Perfect. And just on our end, um, by the way, Ali, your QR code looks much cooler than mine does with you've got a little logo in the middle. <laughs> yeah, I got too much time on my hands. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got a QR code too. That'll take you back to our uh, Brink uh, Edge AI and Vision Analytics uh, landing page. Uh, but what I did want to just uh, create a quick plug for was our Smart Occupancy Sensor Development Kit. So that will be coming out next year and uh, in the early part of next year. And so if you are interested in that and you're interested in getting early access to it, please uh, reach out to me directly. My email address is there. You can also get me on LinkedIn or any of the usual ways, but feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Great, um, thank you. So Mary, yeah, Mary, why don't I hand it back over to you? Yeah, we have a few questions that have come in. We have about 10 minutes or so to um, get through a few of these that have come in. So thanks for that. Great presentation. I love what you've done. Um, really fantastic stuff. Um, so Suya has, is asking quickly, is the Docker container running inside the Yocto environment? Uh, so yeah, we do have, we have, do, we do have uh, Docker containers running inside Yocto. Yeah, so that's completely cool. doable, yeah. So the answer is yes, it is. Thumbs up. Um, <clears throat> Shittage has a question about um, the ARM Cortex M33 CPU drive. Um, Sorry, somebody was calling me right now. Can the ARM C, uh, Cortex M33 CPU drive the uh, MIPI or other camera inputs peripheral? If it can, what's the frame rate expected? If you happen to know this. I don't have, uh, so I'd have to get back to you, Shatish, if you reached out to me on in terms of what the frame rate would be. But uh, yes, so the peripherals can be driven from uh, the Cortex M uh, as far as I'm aware. Great. Um, Maxims has a question. What is the criteria of desk being occupied? What if it's a standing desk? It's interesting. No, that's a good question. So it's yeah. a uh, it's zone based. So really what we do is we, as you sort of saw from the demo, we can draw a region. Uh, so whether whether the desk is standing or, or flat is just going to be just, it will still be in that three dimensional area in space. So it should be fairly straightforward to detect that either way. And it can be modified as well. Uh, what we do uh, provide is some some debounce. So there are some some cases. So for example, you know there's some configurable parameters. How how long do you want to keep a desk occupied after someone leaves? Have they just gone to the washroom? You know, are they coming back? Have they left ob left objects on the desk, etc. So those are kind of uh, interesting side uh, characteristics that we can look at as well, just to make the whole uh, the overall detection uh, more robust and, and uh, more seamless. But standing desk should not be a problem. Great. Um, another question that's come in from Michael, does uh, your security core include Puff? So, uh, so Ali, I think that's, um, on on now you you guys have uh, NXP has some secure ICs that are puff based, don't they? Is that uh... um, correct? So I think uh, I mean we, we do have security ICs. Um, I don't have a direct answer to um, within the secure enclave available on the IWX nine three if that has a physical unclonable function. Uh, that would be a deeper dive into uh, the secure enclave uh, technology, and I think uh, you know we we can get back to you, uh, Michael, on that. Just take a note. Great. Um, another question, a couple more questions that have come in. Uh, U65, uh, is it micro NPU, um, is the micro NPU arm and N and TensorFlow Lite ready? Yes. Yeah, oh, I was gonna answer, but I let you do it. <laughs> Cause I knew. <laughs> um, oh, this is a good one. What happens if a large teddy bear is left on a chair? So, uh, so this is- Sherry. 
This is a, so this is a great question. So, uh, but it's the, you know, it's the big conundrum for all vision-based applications. I mean, for autonomous vehicles, you know, what if someone, uh, you know, changes the, uh, changes this, defaces the speed sign or vandaliz vandalizes it, you know, it's, it's going to be what the alg algorithm detects. Um, but a teddy bear uh, will likely not be detected as a person. So, uh, and if there's a lot of teddy bears in the environment, then we use a fine tuning process to retrain the model to train that out. Uh, so we can add a class that would be teddy bears, and then we can choose to ignore it. Um, but chances are uh, something like a teddy bear would not be, uh, would not be uh, detected. Uh, a mannequin, that, that would be a different, uh, different story. So. That would be, yes. Interesting. Um, maybe another demo that would be that would be kind of interesting to do a quick <laughs> quick demo on that. Well, you know the, the um, example the example that I like to give is um, in when we're looking at security applications and we're trying to use vision for security applications. Um, you know we can detect that a person is breaking into a building by detecting the person breaking into the building. But if they're wearing a bunny costume or if they're you know hiding, yes. as, they're not going to get detected as persons. <laughs> right. So nothing bad is happening. All right. Exactly. Um, <laughs> um, we've got a couple couple late breaking questions come in before we wrap up. So Chloe's asking, is there a trade off between the performance of the vision pipeline and the flexibility of using Docker Compose for fine tuning? Uh, th there is a trade off in, in performance, but the so the biggest performance hit in a uh, in an ML pipeline is going to be inference. Uh, so the inference node itself that's going to be the thing that takes the biggest processing. It's going to be the vision processing and the inference. So while there are while there are some uh, um, trade offs in terms of uh, um, performance optimizations that when you compare it to kind of a monolithic stack, really the biggest bang for your buck is going to be in optimizing your ML performance. Uh, and making it uh, work the best. That's that's going to be absolutely the biggest uh, biggest performance model. Great, great. All right, last question from Aaron. Has there been any data gathered on what sort of expected benefit uplift for organizations such as CBRE with the IMX 93 in the hybrid working environment? Uh, so the, the idea is, I, I think I understand the question, but um, I might... Uh, Maybe have my my colleagues here <laughs> try to help that one too. So uh, the the idea is that um, these these can provide tools for for data. So so what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide the analysis that companies like CBRE can can look at to determine uh, what square footage a particular company really requires. So uh, in the case of uh, some of the uh, medium and and large size companies, they uh, the, the most recent articles that I've read is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of. 30% of their space is not utilized. Uh, and this is a way for them to gauge those metrics uh, to understand what their real estate portfolio really looks like. And, uh, and I think uh, smart occupancy sensing is probably one of the best tools to be able to achieve that. Great. And we've had one more question sneak in around RMNN. So if, it, if RMNN is used for the model inference, does it use NEON and PU or both? And can we select the priority? So yes, you can you can select where uh, which compute engine you're actually running your inference on. Um, traditionally, a recommendation would be some, if something is supported that would go to the NPU, uh, but you can also um, you know target the the, the CPU cores uh, if you uh, wanted to, or if you already have the NPU um, occupied, let's say, or fully utilized. Uh, there are options of running on the on the Cortex M or the Cortex A uh, cores. Yeah, I think, I think our ARMN, if I recall, even has CPU, ACC, and CPU ref as well. I think mm -hmm. one uses uh, NEON and one doesn't, if I, if I recall, but it might be a little bit off on that as well. But I don't know why you wouldn't want to use NEON. I mean, that's uh, yeah. yeah, if you're going on the A core, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, George, we'll squeeze your last question in before we hit the top of the hour. Um, He's asking, what are the main factors you take into account when selecting the two ML models? Uh, so the two, the two factors are always performance and accuracy. I mean, that's just the, the those are the two factors. Uh, and it's always a, a balance because, uh, for, for example, with tracking, uh, tracking will always uh, is, is heavily dependent on accurate detection. So if you start with a poorly performing, low accurate, but fast, uh, model, uh, it's not necessarily going to perform well. 
even though you are doing many frames per second, it may be better to reduce the, frame, the number of frames per second that you're using and use a more accurate model. So especially when you look at things like um, small objects uh, or partial occlusions, uh, that's where we find um, that the more accurate models perform much better. And uh, in, if you're looking at a smart occupancy sensor, a partial occlusion can be someone obstructed by half a desk or when someone else walks in front of somebody. Uh, so partial occlusions can happen pretty regularly. Uh, so performance versus accuracy always. <laughs> yep. Great. Well, with that, I think we have done it. Thank you so much, David and Ali. I always love hanging out with you guys when you come and do these tech talks because there's always something really great going on between your two companies. So really appreciate your time coming to do this with us. And thank you for everybody who uh, hung out with us for the last hour. Hope you learned a lot. Uh, you'll be able to find this recording on YouTube uh, posting later today. So if you want to review it again or send it to your friends who should have been here but could not make it, uh, please feel free. And have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you again next time. And thanks, everybody. We'll uh, talk to you later. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks a lot, Thank Mary. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Yeah.